wonderful to see you, to see you at this last week of teaching, see so many of you. Um, please mute yourself if you're not done so yet. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce our special guest and then we will have a, a lecture of about 40-45 minutes and then clarification and Q&A. So I'm very happy to chair and moderate this session. I'm Sandra Ponsanesi, Professor of Media, Gender and Postcolonial Studies and teaching in this program. And I'm very happy to um, chair this session of Doing Gender Lecture, which is a very illustrious and uh, prestigious lecture series, which the NOH and the GIGE program at the Netherlands School of Gender Study has been hosting. Please mute yourself, otherwise we cannot <laughs> concentrate on the speakers. The Doing Gender Lecture has been a very prestigious series that we've been running for many, many years. And the idea is to not only invite uh, important guests from the field uh, worldwide, but also we had a platform from Aralunna uh, becoming, um, uh, uh, how do you say, established scholars in the meantime. And today I'm very happy to uh, introduce to you um, Professor Jelke Busten, who I've known for a very long time, we go a long way back, because she was uh, with me at the Belefans Island, which was an institute uh, for multiculturalism at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, from there, she just uh, flew away with a brilliant career. She went to the UK, where she's been teaching at the University of Leeds. And then at the moment, she's uh, Professor at King's College, she's Professor in Gender and Development uh, in the Department of International Development. And she has a very interesting track record in studying the question of uh, sexual violence and so social politics, policy and politics, um, which I think she will be uh, highlighting today uh, for us. Let me say a little bit more uh, about her work because she has been, she has published um, sexual violence during war and peace, gender power, post-conflict justice in Peru, because Peru is uh, uh, one of the uh, focus of her work, uh, because she's a specialist in Latin America, but more generally on issues of gender violence and how art question of commemoration and art can actually uh, be transformative and healing and also uh, be part of new form of uh, retributive justice. And I think this will be also the talk she's about to give today, which is inspired by the book she wrote with Ellen Scallon called Gender Transitional Justice and Memorial Arts. Just wanted to mention also that Yelke is now a visiting researcher at the SETLA, which is the in Amsterdam, the Center for Latin American Research and Documentation. So maybe uh, many of the, uh, friends, scholars and students uh, will be joining us today. And I also wanted to give a warm welcome to the even people who are helping us today to host this session, which is through the Orscott and um, Florin Kelstra, and also welcome the um, the program leader of the Gender Graduate Studies program, which is Professor Rosemary Bakuma, who is also among us, is also an expert on issues of transitional justice. And then also I wanted to welcome many of the students in the Research Master program, in the MA program, and also the students in the particular MA program, which is Transitional Justice, Postcolonial Transition and Transitional Justice, because you have this lecture as a topping up of all the other things that you've been exposed to uh, so far with wonderful uh, topics and lectures. Um, maybe without further ado, uh, I will give the, the virtual floor to Yelke, who we really wanted to have in body and person. But again, we have said so many times, alas, alas, this is the reality of today. But on the other hand, we hope that many people are not close by, but also, also uh, stretching from different corners of the world can join in this uh, lecture. So without further ado, Yelka, if we can do anything for you, very thank welcome. You so much. Thank, thank you so much, Sandra. I'm, I'm going to um, do my best to share my screen and see if that works. Um, here we are. That works, no? 
Sandra? Yes. 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 Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for having me, Sandra, and your team uh, at Utrecht for this doing gender uh, lecture. At Utrecht, it is a, a pity that I can't be there with you all. On the other hand, it's also nice to see so many of you here, which perhaps wouldn't have been possible if we would have been in a in a lecture room. So there you go. Um, it's it's as Sandra said, we we go back a long, long way. And but but I left and did other things elsewhere in the world. And um, um, it's been a long time since I engaged with the gender studies community in the Netherlands. And uh, I'm I'm really pleased to 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 for the opportunity to do so now. So thank you for that. Uh, and I look forward to um, uh, to discussing with you all my presentation. Uh, of today. So what I would like to do today is to talk about this research project that we recently finished together with Helen Scanlon in, uh, at the University of Cape Town and a group of other scholars uh, elsewhere in the world in Southern Africa, Latin America and Asia and Europe as well. Um, and I will mention the book uh, Gender Justice and Memory in a bit. Um, and so uh, I'm originally a historian, but doing uh, interdisciplinary gender studies, development studies, Latin American studies, a combination thereof. And my colleague in at the University of Cape Town is also originally a historian, but doing politics and transitional justice. And so together we, we, we um, came up with this very interdisciplinary uh, project that was particularly interested in um, in the arts and me memorial arts. There is here on the slide you see uh, in the top, there's genderjusticememory.com, which is the website that goes with the project. And you can look a little bit more in detail what it is about and, uh, and who has been involved in the project. Um, so, our main question is really in this project, uh, and, and so the discussion started about Peru and South Africa, particularly because both post-conflict countries have such high levels of, of gender-based violence in so-called peacetime, no? So there's always this question, is that then a sequel of conflict, yes or no, and so on. Um, but we really were interested in memory and what we remember and the narratives around um, uh, the uh, uh, past of conflict, because uh, what we remember does not only shape the present, of course, but also the contours of the future. Um, and so the question then is, considering that um, violence against women during conflict, as we know by now, uh, is so very high and very specific. And after conflict, it continues to be very high and very specific and very widespread. So the question then is, why transitional justice processes don't do more about such gender-based violence? No. So we asked the question, what do memorial arts specifically do for gender justice and what does that mean? And I guess our hopes, our, our hypothesis really was in this exploration um, on finding feminist configurations of the past that unsettle gender norms, you know, that denounce all uh, patriarchal violence in war and in peace that can shape uh, the future. Uh, and that can shape the future for a more gender just future. So we really, uh, it, it was a, a network, um, um, uh, it was a network a project. So we had, the, the funding went to bringing people together in three cities, in London, in Lima and in Cape Town, and which allowed us to um, invite scholars, activists, curators, um, artists, lawyers uh, who did strategic litigation around um, uh, conflict related violence, gender based violence, uh, specifically from Southern Africa in Cape Town, specifically from Andean South America in Lima and from all over the world in London. So that was a very, very uh, uh, rich opportunity uh, to bring people together who are otherwise very, very difficult to um, um, 
to have these conversations because of geography and, uh, uh, of course, in great part. So from the, those uh, conversations with this large group of scholars, activists, curators, what we were really interested in is in what formal symbolic reparations, you know, is what, what, what within transitional justice the term is symbolic reparations, or perhaps um, sites of commemoration. What do these do for gender justice? But we are also interested in how the narratives that present that are presented in such sites are contested by more radical perspectives or more activist perspectives, perspectives that are more crit politically critical and looking forward rather than backward. And so thinking about the tremendous volume of different sorts of memorial arts that are out there, we came up with three categories to have an idea to, to separate those because not all memorial art is the same. So we have art that commemorates, which is really the sites of commemoration, the, the museums, the, uh, the burial sites, the statues, you know. Uh, and, and in our research and in our exchange with scholars, we found that it, very often such formal sites tend to confirm certain narratives of history. And they often do not or very rarely do they have a, a more critical gender perspective, although it's not uncommon either in contemporary times, but it's very recent and, and very limited. And then secondly, we looked at cultural interventions. That's a terminology that, that we picked up from Paolo de Greif, who's, uh, who's the uh, reparations person of, the, uh, of the, um, the special representative of the UN, um, uh, uh, which refers to bottom-up art that problematizes and seeks dialogue with different versions of history. But then thirdly, we felt that th that was not the same as protest art or creative activism, uh, that what not only questions, but also disrupts the present. You know? And within feminism, feminist art, this is definitely, especially last five years or so, um, uh, very present in the public sphere, uh, protest art and creative activism. And as I will um, um, show you later on in this talk today, uh, there are very clear links between uh, thinking about narratives of the past and uh, uh, unsettling the narratives of the present. Um, so the book that is the result of this, which came out this year, uh, just now, um, unites a series of case studies that emerge from the three events in London, Lima and Cape Town. And there's a second book in the make that in Spanish, edited by colleagues in Lima, that specifically look at Colombia and Peru. So in what follows, I will further unpack a little bit the questions that I've just raised, drawing some, on some of the work of colleagues who participated in the three conferences, because some of these examples make very much the point that I want to make today. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move to uh, talk more about my own work in Peru, as that seems fair enough, of course. So, um, I guess that despite the increase, there's a global attention for gender and peace building, and particularly for sexual violence in conflict, which some of you m might uh, might know, have an interest in, have read about. But despite this global attention for sexual violence in conflict, there's relatively little attention for women's perspective in commemorative practices. No, and likewise, despite a growing scholarly attention for memorial arts few take a gender perspective. So there seems to be a gap there, which is what we are trying to start um, to fill, of course. Um, so um, in light of the continuing violence against women in most post-conflict countries, and certainly in Peru and in South Africa, this seeming impossibility to tackle such violence through criminal justice and public policy, which we, there's lots of uh, criminal, there's lots of legislation, there's lots of programming, uh, but nothing really changes. So we still need to have this discussion about gender justice and memory battles, which is uh, what we are trying to do here. 
Um, this is an image of uh, the of a museum in the uh, National Museum of Memory in Namibia, and the, the, the image is from Alex Stonehouse, who's a scholar from Namibia, studying in South Africa, who presented in our conference in London. Um, so, if the purpose of symbolic reparations as part of transitional justice is, of course, to generate uh, 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 to, to generate a visibility of the of the role of certain groups and the suffering of her, certain groups. However, very often these commemorations, as we see in this image, is about victors' narratives. No, and this victors' narrative is very often um, about male heroism. No, the soldiers who won. No. So uh, transitional justice debates have changed this somehow, no? Uh, reconciliation and justice are elements that need to be considered much more. Nevertheless, much of the formal commemorative displays, and not only in Namibia, but around the world, still try to emphasize this type of victor's justice, no? And it's very difficult to uh, to, to present a more balanced views. And this is particularly uh, true for images of women, no? Uh, it, it, these, these displays tend to reproduce stereotypes of women. They're often portrayed as nurses, caretakers, vulnerable victim, or as mothers who have lost. And in this case, uh, uh, even as combatants, but uh, which suggests that there have here in, in one of these is a, is a woman, uh, which suggests that there have been many more women combatants, but they're definitely not foregrounded, no? So women's agency is very often uh, uh, hidden among the agency of heroic men. And I thought that this one is, the, th this image is a mural display in the same museum depicting the Kasinga massacre of 1978, which really focuses on the desperate and half-naked bodies of women. And it even sexualizes women's suffering and makes Namibian vulnerability then um, a very much uh, a female affair, no? And even defeat is a female aff affair, while victory is a male affair and reconstruction is a male affair. And women do play a role, but they have very specific stereotypical uh, uh, gendered roles, as we see in this image. Uh, from the same museum. So this is a typical, it's a, it, it's a, it, it's a, these three images are, are very generous perhaps in, in showing you how, how uh, uh, certain commemorative practices reproduce gendered stereotypes and how unhelpful that is because it doesn't allow for more nuanced um, uh, images of um, men and women, of course. Um, this image is from uh, another scholar um, uh, and uh, poet, Choman Hardy, from the American University in um, Iraqi Kurdistan, who also presented uh, her work in uh, London. And uh, her work refers to the so-called Anfal geno genocide of the late 1980s, in which Saddam Hussein carried out multiple gas attacks against the people of Kurdistan. And these events are currently commemorated year after year by circulating horrific images in the public sphere. Yeah, so th these images have a political um, um, aim. They're instrumental. They're instrumentally used by the political elite of, Kur of Iraqi Kurdistan. It mobilizes uh, a griefing mothers for public display of a continuous suffering. So the women, the mothers are, are, are basically urged and encouraged to show their suffering in the public space. And as Choman Hardy showed, this does not do good, of course, because it's not a forward looking remembering and less so a reparation, symbolic or otherwise. Rather, it is very harmful and it keeps people stuck in, in this past and in their own grief. It does not allow anyone to move on, less so the suffering mothers who are who are not only stuck in this grief, but also in their roles as mothers of this defeated nation. So there's very little space for women to, to self-define uh, their identity or their role as political beings. And by annually commemorating this Amphal genocide through a repetitious display of dead and deformed bodies in the media, um, accompanied by this expectation of women's public mourning, 
uh, women's suffering as mothers become the emblem of Kurdish claims for restitution, which is really problematic. So even their suffering is really mobilized for political gain of a particular uh, uh, political project. And the portrayal of women as vulnerable re reproducers of the nation also reinforces the need for masculine protection, of course. You know? So how these binary stereotypes of women as victims um, and, and men as, 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 as heroes uh, creates this, this narrative where, where women need the protection of men and men need to be violent to protect the nation. And in that sense, these narratives also be become easily mobilizable for future violence. And that is uh, a problem, of course. Okay, so I'll move to uh, the Peruvian case study. In Peru, this is just some, uh, I don't expect anyone to know very much about Peru, so that's fair enough. So these are just the simple facts. You don't need to know very much uh, about the conflict, just that there was a conflict between insurgents from Shining Path and the MRTA, which were very, very violent, um, and a counterinsurgency by the state, which was equally violent or in a different way, but it was very violent. The Truth Commission between 2001 and 2003 um, uh, estimated that there were 70,000 dead and disappeared, of which 70% 70 70 was of indigenous descent. Peru is a very unequal country with a largely white European descent uh, uh, political and business elite and uh, poor rural people of indigenous descent. Um, and 40%, which is a lot of those casualties, were the responsibility of the military. Sexual violence was systematic, violence against women was systematic, particularly on the part of the military, according to the Truth Commission. And as Sandra said before, um, I wrote a book on this, uh, based on, on largely based on Truth Commission testimonies as well, which came out in 2014. Now, after the Truth Commission issued it, its report in 2003, there emerged a, a very rich field of memory work. Huh? So it, 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 there's a, there's a, there are very clear contested narratives of the past. No, there is a narrative that is that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, in which the military, i.e., the state, was an important actor in perpetrating atrocity and human rights abuses. Yeah. So the state and the military was not the heroic victor, but was an actor in the escalating violence. And the analysis of the Truth Commission is then that that this all this is a, is is what was a consequence of structural violences and inequality in the country. So that's one narrative. And then the other narrative is the military that wants to defend itself. Yeah, who says no? Um, all, all that if there was, if there were atrocities on the military side, that was because of rotten apples or uh, mistakes, and otherwise uh, their acting has been um, heroic. No, um, nobody doubts the culpability of Shining Path, which really was very violent, and uh, uh, Shining Path members, the majority of actors, are either dead or in prison. Some are coming out actually now after more than 20, 25 years in prison. Um, but nobody doubts that, so that's not the question. It's really about the role of the military. There's still multiple large and important trials against ex-military ongoing now, um, as they are accused of, of um, crimes against humanity, including conflict-related sexual violence. So this is where memory work becomes a memory battle between the narrative around human rights on the one hand and the military narrative on the other hand. So let's look at the military na narrative a little bit further. This is an image of uh, uh, an annual commemoration of a particular battle over um, the, uh, a hostage crisis in the mid-1990s in uh, the embassy of Japan in Lima. And uh, the military um, um, saved the hostages, but also shot the hostage, hostage takers. And um, these were extrajudicial, 
uh, executions. So on the one hand, the military celebrates this victory, Chavin de Huanta, how they call it, and it says 11 years afterwards, this is an older picture, and we did it for Peru, so they celebrate this as a victory, while at the same time there is an ongoing um, a, a trial or an attempt at a trial, there are accusations, it has been at the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, for example, to uh, investigate the uh, behavior of the military in that particular battle. And this is typical for uh, for what's going on in a Peruvian context. And again, this is the military version. So the military has established a display to com commemorate these events in a heroic light. Um, and they use these events as well to train new recruits. Um, but of course, the interesting thing is that among the military, the understanding of the past is not straightforward either. You know? It's not that the military is one front with one opinion about a heroic past. Um, and in order to investigate that, I started a new project um, uh, to, to interview uh, veterans and particularly um, ex-military officers and troops who fought in the early 1990s and their versions of what happened and what was a mistake or what are human rights abuses is completely different where the officers are the elite troops who have who, who maintain these um, this heroic uh, narrative and the troops have a completely different uh, versions uh, the troops tell stories about extreme violence within the barracks. Yeah, so they tell stories about including rape uh, amongst troops and captains, suggesting a completely different gendered truth than is recognized so far. And the image that you see here is clearly not part of formal commemorative practices, but forms part of a recent cultural event that we organized together as part of the research project, together with an association of veterans, uh, which was a, a, a painting contest competition um, about memories of the conflict. You can read about this project as well on the website Gender Justice Memory. And this was just to show how difficult it is to have one narrative or even uh, to have a, a coherent narrative with which everyone can um, can buy into, but how important it is at the same time to have those different voices, because in the end, those different voices will help establish a different truth and a different dialogue between uh, members of society. So these, uh, this is a group of uh, mothers of the disappears, disappeared, similar to organizations in Argentina and Chile, about which I'm sure you have read if you do um, a, a course on transitional justice. Um, the Madres de Plaza de Mayo, the, the mothers of, of, the, of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina. And this is very similar. This group is known AMFACEP for its initials in Spanish, and they have campaigned for justice since the disappearance of their loved ones, uh, largely children, but also husbands, so uh, young men and women and husbands, um, since the early 1980s. So these women are now um, ancient, they're old, they're, uh, uh, but there's a young group of children of the disappeared who are uh, now being the activists for justice. Now, what I find interesting, if we if we if we do a gender analysis of these of of these mothers groups, then we have to ask what do they do for unsettling sexual hierarchies, which is a term that Ruth Rubio Marin uses when she talks about reparations and gender. You no. Know? So the question then is, how do initiatives from women contribute to a feminist project of, 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 of gender justice? You know? Even if it's not labeled explicitly as gender justice or feminism, that's irrelevant, but we can still ask what it does. You know? Does it re reproduce stereotypes? Does it unsettle something? What, what does it do? Now, Amphacep, um, 
uh, consists mainly of women who have resisted state violence of all sides and have insisted on justice by presenting themselves as mothers of the disappeared, no? And that motherhood also creates a certain legitimacy and hence a certain safety, certain protection, particularly in the war years. And even now, um, in the last couple of years, less so, but definitely after the Truth Commission, they were still attacked by military actors uh, for their activism because they accuse military of uh, human rights uh, violations, no? So their political identity as mothers also protected them very much. And this image of the Andean mother holding a portrait of her son or her daughter is, is very powerful, of course, that has framed these struggles for justice. And they're still very important in, um, in Peru. They have a museum, they have memorial sites, this uh, slide is a is a memorial site um, on top of um, of a, which is an, um, um, uh, it's a mass grave built by the military and they're appropriating it um, in order to build a, a memorial to their loved ones you know and the military is constant constantly pushing back because they don't want that they want to build on top of it so that nobody can exhume the bones anymore. So there is there is again there is a memory battle between actors who were there very clearly present. You no. Know? And this is the museum that they built again. So this is not a state um, uh, funded uh, initiative. It's actually largely funded by the by Germans. German. Um, what do you call them? The SG. The well, the German development um, community. Um, so it's very much their version of history. And it's it's a very interesting uh, uh, version and a very interesting museum and how they present themselves is very interesting. Now, one of the things that strikes when you look at the museum and what's in there and how they present themselves is that, that they, also in the museum, they present themselves as carers, as mothers, and as witnesses of the violence, but they never really denounce, report or reflect on the violence that they themselves have undergone. Yeah. So there's no mention of the sexual violence that they have experienced by the same military, but only about the violence that their family members and their members of the communities have suffered and the activities that they have undertaken in protection and care of those loved one, ones. No. And I've thought a lot about that. So what does that mean in, in, from a gender perspective? No, is this reproducing stereotypes or not, or not? And in the end, I think that in making this, uh, the, the caring uh, for others, the central point of their narrative of the political conflict, actually the museum narrates the heroic nature of the resistance. Of these women, no, and in doing so, they subvert this masculine heroic narrative of war and of violence. They basically refuse to 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 act or in the name of the national cause, uh, or in support of any male agenda of male political agenda of heroism. They just eschew that; it's just not part of their narrative. And in turn, they foreground care and mourning in their str struggles for justice and memory. So I think that such subversion does help shift emphasis and undermines the legitimacy of male violence. And in doing so, perhaps motherhood itself becomes a really a politicized and perhaps even a subversive uh, identity. And then in the capital, so this was all rural in the highlands where, where, where the center of violence was in the 1980s and early 90s. And in the capital uh, uh, of Peru, Lima, there is a, a museum which was opened uh, after much political controversy for the same uh, memory battles that I've just explained uh, over what can be said by whom and, and why and how, et cetera, et cetera. But it was opened in 2016. Now, uh, applying a gender analysis on the museum, we can see that women are certainly not invisibilized in the exhibitions. There is no heroic, ver uh, heroic narrative of, of, uh, uh, of male victory or anything. It's very balanced. It really tries to be an educational um, 
and it tries to keep uh, the balance between uh, perpetrators, uh, victims, and everything in between. No, so it does its best to provide a narrative for everyone, um, and that's why it's still open. I guess it managed reasonably well to do that. Um, women are very much part and parcel of the stories as mothers, as fighters, as carers, as uh, as victims, as uh, as perpetrators. It's a very much the result of a conscientious curatorship on the part of the team. Now, secondly, um, there still is the question of the issue of sexual violence, knowing that the Truth Commission uh, uh, found that sexual violence was systematic, it was uh, widespread and particularly on the part of the military. So this continues to be an important issue and uh, important in highlighting uh, also judicially, of course. So uh, apart from that, the, the sexual violence was the, the, the main way in which gender was highlighted in the Truth Commission report. No, it, re it also received its own corner in the museum. Neither the corner in, corner in the museum, neither the, the, the chapter in the Truth Commission report were planned. They were, they were the result of a lot of pushing of feminist activists and curators and researchers and scholars to get that uh, on the agenda. But they were accepted and are on the agenda. Um, so for this corner in the museum, the, uh, there were consultations took place not with victim survivors who are likely to live far away in the rural Andes and are difficult to reach. Um, and they're also unlikely to be keen on giving their opinion on the issue. But there was consultation with all kinds of experts, including myself. And the result of that is this wall of phrases, words, women about their experiences with sexual violence, all taken from the T Truth Commission uh, report and uh, testimony. So in that sense, it's very close to the victim survivors. These are their words. They're anonymous. Some are in Quechua, the language of, of uh, indigenous highland uh, uh, campesinos. Uh, and they're a powerful display of, on the one hand, the horror of conflict-related sexual violence, but very much without sensationalizing it through images. So that's all positive. The downside is that the wall is more or less the last item one gets to see if one follows the recommended route through the museum, i.e. it's hidden away at the end as an afterthought. Um, the victim survivors whose stories it tells are unaware of its existence. So in that sense, the museum also recognizes the suffering of women, but it does very little in terms of recovering victim survivors agency or dignity. Or the question is then symbolic reparation. Or does it provide any symbolic reparation? Um, the question is for whom? No. Now, moving on to slightly more uh, uh, cultural interventions, as uh, the Greif called them, no? So all the, the, the uh, events, performances, theater, um, uh, arts that emerged in the wake of the Truth Commission, there was a lot of it. And some of it was actually part of the Truth Commission as uh, a way of, of providing information in rural communities, for example, working with rural communities. So there was a lot of theater, professional theater uh, with rural communities uh, to raise awareness about, about certain issues. Um, and other interventions or other um, memorial arts uh, emerged simply from the population. You no, know? a lot of artesania or uh, uh, art from the population um, uh, emerged that depicts scenes of 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 uh, of what of their own history, you know, very specific of particular um, um, particular communities, particular events, particular massacres were all are all out there, you know, very harrowing, but also very necessary as a as a as a way of creating a field for discussion and dialogue, even if very often with very painful results with the main advantage that it allows for many more voices to be heard you know, than that formal commemorative sites could ever aspire to, if only because formal commemorative sites that are curated by urban educated uh, elites, they haven't been there largely. You know? so, you, so these, these um, bottom-up 
commemorative arts uh, provides a, a different perspective. But then the question still is, um, where are the women in all of this? No. Um, so in Peru, the scholarly and intellectual debates tend to revolve around male writers, film and theater makers, male art, you know, uh, male artists. And if you look at the, the, the book that I consulted for this, uh, Cultural Interventions by Pablo Le Greif, the book is called Transitional Justice, Culture and Society. I think it's from 2014 or 15. And they also talk largely about a male canon of largely European trauma literature. You know? So apparently it's very difficult to get out of this uh, male stream kind of frame um, in, into a more balanced and different perspective. Um, and this means, of course, inevitably, that the intellectual and scholarly debates about narratives of conflict that emerge around these cultural product, products also eschew uh, gender analysis, let alone uh, a feminist perspective. So in most of these literary works, the role of women are not really present. They're present, but they are, are pathetic, literally. I, they are the victims, they're uh, side roles, they're figurants in an introspective journey that men might make. Now, I'd like to tell the story about this play because it's it's an interesting and very specific um, um, indication of the particular gendered memory battles around violence in the Peruvian context. Um, the play was uh, is called La Cautiva, which is the captive, and it was staged in an upper middle class theater in 2014. The play tells the story of a young girl, a 14 year old Andean girl called Maria Josefa, who sometime during the mid 1980s wakes up in the morgue of a military base. Yeah. So she insists that the, the, the whole play is about a dialogue between Maria Josefa, who's dead, but she tells her story to the assistant doctor who is at the back of the in this in this. Uh, picture, who is tasked with preparing Maria Josef, Josefa's dead body to be raped once again by those who have first raped and killed her, the military. Yeah. The captive and, uh, and the assistant embark on a narrative journey through the big themes of Peruvian memory battles. Who is really innocent? Who is guilty? What is cruelty? What is justice? And what is just silence? And what when does silence become complicity? The story is art and imagination, of course, but it is based on the experiences of those who testified before the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Committee. So these kind of things happened. This was based on truth. Yeah? And the play received a, a, a lot of support from, um, uh, from the audience and from the cultural elite in Lima. According to one cri cri critic, this was the very best political, historical and poetic theater of our times and, and so on. There was a lot of praise for, for the play. But in all this praise, nobody actually discusses the core of the play, yeah, what it is actually about. The play uh, also generated heated debate at high political levels and actually the Ministry of Interior ordered the police and the prosecutor to investigate the play for apology of terrorism. I, they accused the, the, the director and the, the playwright of, um, of presenting a narrative that could be interpreted as an apology for terrorism for, because they accused the military, of course. The investigation was dropped, there was protest and really cool uh, and so on, but it, it indicates the, the level of what a memory battle is or can be, you know. Now, importantly, in this political fight over a play, no one mentioned the fact that it was about the military raping murdered girls. This fact, central to the play, was never discussed, not in the praise for the play, nor in the battle over getting it shut down or uh, defending it. Yeah, so the atrocity at the center of the play was never questioned, denied, nor confirmed. That fact was basically imaginable. And that then brings me to a novel 
often hailed as central to the post-conflict literature in Peru uh, is, is a novel, La Hora Azul, The Blue Hour, uh, from I think it's 2005. And this novel, I won't explain the plot, but what it does is that it, it fails to notice the sexual violence at the center of the narrative. So there's a, an instance of, 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 of sexual violence in, at the center, and instead it actually manages to reproduce it. Yeah, it reproduces in its narrative the same violence, and it doesn't. So it's not a critique, it actually reproduces it. And I think that even the, 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 the cover of the book also indicates, you know, if this is supposed to be a, a young girl just as Maria Josefa, then it's rather insulting to portray her as a seductive young girl at the, at the cover of a book. Nevertheless, Again, the novel was received uh, with high regard. It was even discussed as bringing reconciliation, which from a feminist perspective, it definitely never did. You know? But there's change. There's, there's also a chronology in what I'm, uh, in what I'm uh, telling you all. So things do change, and they change because of these battles and because of the meddling of, of feminists. You know? So women also write about the conflict, uh, most notably this novel by Claudia Salazar from 2013. And this is very much uh, a, a feminist novel. Again, I'm not sure she would call it like that, but it definitely is. It brings women's perspectives. It unsettles the male gaze. It unsettles the gender binary and it provides, a, uh, it unsettles the juxtaposition or the binary between victims and perpetrators. The novel was well, well received, reasonably well read, mainly by women. Um, in the meantime, since the publication of this novel, more women start, have started writing, or rather, they've always written, of course, but more women get published. And that is in great part because they themselves have set up their own publishing companies. Yeah, so uh, uh, women set up their publishing companies because otherwise they don't get published. There is even now, since two years or so, uh, a women only um, bookshop because otherwise bookstores don't foreground um, and highlight uh, the literature written by women. So this Peruvian feminist memorial literature might better be called counter memories against the hegemonic male narrative, as Hirsch and Smith would call it, counter memory. Counter memories comes from Hirsch and Smith. So the point of a feminist counter memory is then to visibilize the invisible, to show that there are other narratives and to reveal gender biases. Yeah? And that is what Peruvian feminist artists, writers and filmmakers do. They circumvent formal mainstream spaces and create their own and thereby changing the cultural landscape itself, for example, by establishing their own uh, publishing houses. So I'm going to look now at that third category that I said. We had um, um, the sites of commemoration, cultural interventions, and now I'm going to go into activist art. And using art, including performance, is of course as a protest has a long history in Latin America and elsewhere and I won't review that history here but one of the most interesting characteristics I find, find in the current wave of activist art particularly feminist activist art is precisely how conflict related and everyday gendered violations are enmeshed yeah so they become the activism of today is very much building on uh, human rights violations of the past and vice versa. There's, there's, a, there's a line between these two. So memory battles have become particularly forward looking, much more than the previous uh, uh, artistic expressions that I, um, that I discussed uh, just now. Secondly, contemporary, contemporary feminist activism uses social media, for example, uh, as well as the streets to convey their message and also the formal art houses and the exhibition spaces uh, and so on. So there is a very interesting and highly dynamic way of communication going on that is very much of this is very contemporary. There are three campaigns that I will briefly highlight. One issue of forced sterilizations in the mid 1990s, one around gender based violence and one around visibility and voice. This image is a performance uh, against forced sterilizations or rather, so this was 
let me explain that a little bit better. So there's a sterilization campaign implemented by the Fujimori government, who was the authoritarian leader of Peru in the uh, in the decade of 1990. Yeah. And in mid 1990s, he, he implemented a family planning program, which it later on or uh, a couple of years later appeared to be uh, a quota system of uh, forcibly uh, sterilizing mainly uh, poor women of indigenous descent. And estimate is that that, that has affected about 300,000 women. So some are starting to call this a genocide now. Um, there has been quite some judicial and social activism around this, uh, but but there, there there's not there hasn't been a, a proper uh, investigation. It wasn't part of the truth commission investigations and hearings either, so it was never properly uh, investigated or addressed. And this means that we don't really know how many women were actually forced, physically or otherwise manipulated into sterilizations, how many of those 300,000, how many women were physically or mentally hurt, uh, and what the broader societal effects have been of this, um, um, of, of this um, uh, population control program. Um, and this means that the issue, the lack of formal redress and justice means that the issue lingers and festers just as conflict related sexual violence doesn't go away simply by ignoring it. Yeah. So the attempts at ignoring and even silencing the issue on the part of elites actually or successive governments uh, and the judiciary has pushed activists into the, the public space. Wider society is not interested in this either, huh? because it's too it's uh, it's women's reproductive health. Um, um, wider society in a patriarchal society such as Peru is not interested. But activists becoming every time more uh, aggressive, more more visible, more um, uh, more visibly uh, aggressive, perhaps or explicit. They have created alliances with victims groups, largely poor indigenous women, which has created also very powerful images. Now, the interesting one of the interesting things is that it creates a link between contemporary rights for abortion and reproductive health and um, uh, former violations of human rights. I'm going to speed up a little bit, Sandra, because I see that I'm talking far longer than I had planned. Um, the other issue that I wanted to mention, likewise, the link between uh, past violence and contemporary activism is the violence against women. This is a major uh, Me Too kind of um, uh, um, protest on the streets of Lima in 2016, um, which very much built on earlier campaigns against sexual violence and conflict, yeah? And there is also, it the, it coincided, the March in 2016 coincided with the start of a trial against 13 veterans of the Peruvian military who are accused of systematically raping win, women in the high Andes. So again, contemporary violence and uh, uh, historical violence are very much linked in these protests. And art is very much present in these protests as well. This is in memory of Maria Elena. Maria Elena was uh, uh, a woman's leader of the, of the so-called popular classes, as, as uh, they referred to themselves in the early 1990s, and she was killed by Shining Path. And this is an artistic uh, example that was in galleries, in, in fancy galleries in the center of Lima of Maria Elena. So again, activism, art, and cross-class alliances were very important in these. Uh, pro uh, protest. Now, lastly, uh, this is about visibility. So from that, um, again, there's a chronology. We were in 2016, we moved to 2019. This is a, pro a, phys a, a very much an artistic protest online um, set up by poets and writers, feminist poets and writers who were completely fed up with the uh, uh, with the patronizing way uh, they were treated by their male colleagues, publishing houses, bookshops, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they created a very um, um, strong, visually strong campaign to put to to push their own agenda, including poetry uh, and so on. And this is another one: "Levantate y ladra" means uh, uh, step up and bark. And the same. Now, to conclude, 
the question that I started with, what do feminist memorial arts do for gender justice? Yeah, I think it's a, a feminist perspective on the past is essential for gender equality in the present and in the future. As we have seen with doing this gender analysis, this past 45 minutes or so of memory work shows that a critical perspectives that unsettles patriarchal politics and mainstream or mainstream narratives of violence reproduces that same violence. So if transitional justice aims for a never again, that includes women, then changing the narratives of the past is essential. We need narratives that explicitly name and denounce conflict related as gender violence, including sexual violence, and that make that link between societal inequalities and injustices that precede and follow conflict. You know? So really that the, those links uh, in time. So a feminist perspective of transitional justice and memory with a feminist perspective, then I mean a perspective that contains a political critique aiming for social change and gender justice really matters. And I just want to highlight that there are some real tangible successes of these last uh, in, in which feminist memory work has played a central role. Yeah, although it seems all um, uh, futile, it's not a trial against the architect of the forced sterilization campaign has opened just two weeks ago, 25 years after the fact, but this had not happened were it not for that feminist activism that kept it going, that kept it going, that kept it in the public eye, even against, uh, um, uh, with a lot of pushback from elites and civil society as well. Secondly, uh, a trial against the 13 ex-military started in 2016. Again, it, it, it's a slow and frustrating trial, but it's ongoing. It's, it's and, and very much because of feminist activists uh, keeping it alive. And then thirdly, a feminist poet, the one who uh, established Commando Plath in 2019, uh, this year won the National Prize for Nonfiction. Uh, and the women only publishers and bookstores are thriving, even if it's small scale. So in that sense, feminist activism through memory work and the arts might be actually a really quite powerful fo force working towards uh, a never again in, in transitional justice speak, you no, know? and perhaps even an essential force in working for gender justice. If you're interested, the gender justice memory um, a website has more information also on the veterans uh, project that I uh, mentioned a little bit before. I'll leave it at that. Sorry for talking so long. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. It was a, a riveting and super rich lecture of course that has been fully engaging so we didn't feel the time pass at all. I think it's also a wonderful illustration of uh, the lecture series, the doing uh, gender lecture series, because you really show uh, the way in which doing gender can work, eh? not only doing memory, but doing gender. What is the state of the art um, in defining gender and how contemporary scholars like you, but also activists utilize this definition eh? and also yeah. artists in your case. So it's very beautifully elaborated and I think there is a lot of food for thought. Uh, what we usually do first is a round of clarification. Okay. So if uh, people in the audience would like to ask something as a clarification first, you can do it by unmuting yourself or putting in the chat and we can also moderate that. Um, you might need some minutes to digest it all, but we still have half an hour, so we can breathe for a moment, think about it. But please ask, and as I always say, there are no questions that are uh, there are no questions that are wrong. Just ask anything that you think or that you don't understand or that you uh, yeah, whatever you want to ask. It's all questions are good. While we wait, I think it's so wonderful that we have been addressed in different parts of the world. Uh, and South Africa, of course, is very prominent for the truth and reconciliation. Uh, but personally, I didn't know there was a truth and reconciliation in Peru as well. I know that I'm in other uh, Latin American countries. Um, so it is interesting to see how 
uh, because your project has been a comparative one in a way, even yeah. though located in different places. And I, I, I was very much caught by your uh, mentioning at the very beginning that this has been post-conflict society and because of the traumatic past, somehow they have these legacies and traces into the presses are remaining violent. So the question is not only uh, because they were violent, the state violence, but because also the militarized form the violence took and the militarized violence that, of course, uh, unbalanced all the gender justice yeah. that these images are uh, working for. But it's it's like all this truth and reconciliation commis commission did not work through into reorganizing the society in more equitable terms. And I was wondering whether you knew something about how the different Truth and Reconciliation Commission works in different continents, let's say. Yeah. But the historical differences are enormous, so it's different yeah. to compare. But the practices that they use, whether they could be compared and the results. Yeah. That, that's a, a huge question that I that, that is difficult to answer. But, but we actually, with Helen Scanlon, we, we, we really wanted to have a big project looking from a feminist perspective, comparing the different truth uh, or transitional justice processes, uh, not only truth commissions, no, and wh what it means for gender justice. Um, um, so maybe we'll do that still in the future. But the, the, I think one of the interesting things is that so th there is a thriving transitional justice community out there with a lot of expertise, of course, no, and w which learns constantly, um, which is an international community. And so there definitely every truth commission is a little bit more refined and a little bit more uh, the truth or the, the transitional justice processes, the way it is designed in Colombia, for example, is it, I've never seen something so relatively feminist, you no, know? the way they talk about commemoration, for example, and the museum that is that is being designed is really, really quite feminist. Um, but they can't get it off the ground because the political reality is that factions are still fighting. You no. Know? So the interesting thing is that that the transitional justice has become this template with with very smart experts and who 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 can come up with fantastic frameworks but the reality is very often still very complex and very um fragmented and it's very difficult to deal with that via a transitional justice framework and you see that every time again and again in all these different sites in tunisia in colombia in guatemala in, well, in the southern cone in south africa everywhere in the and in Namibia, everywhere it's 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 very difficult to um, to to um, to really address the roots of violence through a, a truth commission. It's mm. almost impossible. Yeah, sadly so. There is uh, one question already. Maybe we can give the floor. I don't know whether it's Morena Pardo. Maybe you want to unmute yourself. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Elke. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, I am from Argentina, so um, evidently so the subject is uh, pretty close to my heart. And I was curious, listening to you, to ask you um, why did you choose uh, or how how did it come to um, to be Peru, the the specific country of of research and, and of interest, because even though we have a lot of, of similarities in of, of history in the Latin American context, and even within South America, we also have a lot of specificities to each of, the, yeah. of our recent histories and how this, we can say, conflicts or, you know, yeah, this um, processes of, of state violence happened yeah. and how those developed after the, we can say, the end, if there is an end to, to those conflicts. Yeah, it's a very good question, and it links a bit to uh, the, the previous Sandra's question. No, is that actually all those differences, the specificities of each political and historical context, matters in what happens afterwards? You no, know, in what the landscape is of violence and inequality, but also in what the political landscape is, or what the factions are, and how how one uh, how certain issues can or cannot be. Uh, raised and discussed in the public sphere and so on. So the political context matters enormously, and which means that 
any kind of transitional justice template um, has to be adapted to the local context because there's, you know, it's very difficult in that sense to do sort of a, a very political science-y kind of comparison with tick boxes and variables is not terribly useful because the actual complex context is always intervening and messing things up. So in that sense, that that that's not the kind of of um, comparison that I'm necessarily interested in either. Precisely because of this, no. Um, I chose. I've I've been studying Peru for a very very long time. For I don't know. Yeah, it's so long to, long ago that I don't remember how I ended up there. But that's how where I ended up. And I actually started when Sandra and I worked together at the Bella Fazzelli Institute on poor women and social policy. And but one of the things that came out of working with poor women. Uh, in Peru, in a Peruvian context, urban and rural, is that actually everyday violence from husbands, from community members, from authorities, from the healthcare center, from institutions, from uh, in the education sphere, from everywhere, was actually the main concern and uh, the, the the issue that 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 that, uh, that shaped their lives perhaps most. And the other interesting thing I found in those in those early interviews is that th that there didn't seem in the way women talked about violence there was in the same events the same violent events um, could be a completely different experience depending on who was the perpetrator or what was the context. Yeah. So a rape perpetrated by a military was a different story than the husband. And that kind of interpretation of what do we do with violence, even if it's the same act, but what how context, how contextualization matters in how we personally, but also institutionally interpret violence and the infringement on women's bodies is where I got interested in conflict and in in in, in gender and, and conflict, you know. So that's how I ended up with this, really. Thank you, Marina. Your mute is Sandra. Anyone else want to jump in? I'm sure you have a lot of questions and. Um, and I have many, but I don't want to monopolize these discussions, so please. Yes, somebody else, Andrea. Yes. Yes, hi. I'm oh, sorry, my. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, Thank you for this uh, for this amazing lecture. Uh, I have a question. I'm from Peru, and I'm uh, very familiar with uh, with uh, the history that you just uh, explained to all of us. But um, I'm actually researching on artist agency in Peruvian cultural institutions. So uh -huh. I wanted to know um, what's your perspective on how this. Uh, narratives or these uh, artists that mostly work uh, with uh, communities or in uh, activist spaces are inserted into the institutions such as uh, yeah the truth commission or the uh, group of mothers in ayacucho and such as how they are inserted in institutions yeah how is the how are they included in this group okay. For yeah. example, in the Truth Commission, I know Natalia Guinness, Eliana Ota have been working there. Yeah. And how is it that they can actually get into these positions that their uh, voices and their uh, way of understanding history through images are also yeah. taken into account? Yeah. So uh, it's a very interesting question, Andrea. Um, so I think that you know Peru well, but I'm going to explain it because not everybody does perhaps, is that I think that the, the, the sort of the class divide, which is a, a class race, socioeconomic, urban, rural, education, it's a divide that is multiple layered, uh, makes that some women have more access to institutions than others. You know? So the people that you mentioned are all uh, well-connected, well-educated, um, um, have access to certain spaces that the women in Ayacucho of Amphaset will not. 
But this is why I think that the building of alliances, and this is not unique to Peru at all. This is it happens elsewhere in in it everywhere in Latin America, definitely, and I'm sure that it happens elsewhere as well. Is that the building of alliances between different social groups is really important to get anything on the political agenda. You know, the forced sterilizations would not have been on the political agenda, nor but the judiciary, if it wasn't for the alliance between more urbanized educated feminists from Lima and those victim groups in um, in more rural areas. And the same is true for uh, the issue of sexual violence in conflict and for all the other issues. No, it, you need a particular kind of capital, resources, time, education, information, access to certain networks in order to get access to these political spaces and institutions. That's just a fact. No, if you're from rural Ayacucho, then there's no way that on your own you get access to those spaces. And it's awful to say but that's, I think, the reality, which is why I think that in contemporary times where social media is every time more important and hence it becomes easier to create those alliances across space and across class is really changing the landscape of feminist activism because there's a lot more groups that previously would have much less access that are now raising their voice using social media, you know, and new alliances are created. So I think that that is a very positive and interesting, difficult as well with all kinds of tensions and so forth, but it's interesting and it's important and it ultimately it will create a more democratic society, I think. Thank you, Jelke. You satisfied, Andrea? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> there anyone else? I was intrigued by the way you you had like a two track uh, discussion. One was the way in which women were obliterated from their participation in a uh, revolution or in conflict and there is a typical case in which either they get remembered in stereotypical role or they get erased from independence and nation uh, building but i was intrigued by the way in which you said once they come with art or with movement to protest they sometimes do appropriate uh, stereotypical gender roles um, so your question was whether they reinforce the stereotype or they subvert them and my question to you is, do they take this stereotypical role to be recognized in the public sphere that it is assigned to them before subverting it? Or they are just implicitly uh, unable to see transformative model, which you did present through the, the art, especially the activism, which is very uh, groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's very interesting, and I have asked the women, the mothers of the disappeared. I've asked them about feminism. No, where do you what what, what do you think? And then they say, oh, you know more about that, Yalke. Feminism, I don't know. You know more about that, and I get that. No, because feminism is also a um, um, well, it's a concept, and a conceptual education is not necessarily what rural women um, have access to. But they understand justice and they understand caring for each other and they understand mourning because that's lived experience. And hence, you know, I, I think that a lot of the sort of some of the activism that on, the, on, on that superficially seems to reproduce those gendered stereotypes are actually relatively strategic in order to be able to do what they do. I mean, they're, of course, they know that they're also activists and that they're capable of doing this, that and the other. But they also know that if they would, they, they, they wouldn't get anywhere. The only way to get somewhere is to use that image of the mother and to use it to their benefit. And that is very strategic and and um, and uh, conscious, I think. I don't think that that is an, a sort of a, um, an unconscious re reproduction of stereotypes. Absolutely not. So it's using particular stereotypes to create space to fight for justice. And I think that that in itself is enormously um, subversive. No. So you use you create a political identity out of a out of a, a stereotypical um, reproductive identity that that actually takes away autonomy and agency 
but they turn it around and they actually use it to create autonomy and agency. And, and I guess that, that is the point that I wanted to make, that, that actually, you know, you, you can literally turn it around. And I think that that's what they do. And that creates a counter, a political, politically is really important, I think. Absolutely. Um, I think Rosemary would like to jump in now. Please. As the expert on transitional justice. <laughs> Not particularly, but um, <laughs> I was. Uh, I was well, one of the experts. One of the experts. I was. Um, uh, uh, thank you, of course, Yelka. Wonderful to listen to your research and to know more about your case studies. Um, um, one of the things which I would like to have a, a little bit more of a discussion about is this, um, this, 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 your sort of question: What can Feminist, what can the encounter between feminism and transitional justice uh, um, do? And what does it entail, basically, this encounter? Um, and I think that a lot of uh, feminist uh, literature concerning this, this encounter between feminism and, and transitional justice is concerned about is the, um, the definition, not so much of justice, but the definition of violence. And in that context, in that context, I was struck by the mural you showed. I think it was a mural in Lima, where the women uh, represent themselves as caretakers and of having sorrows about, and indeed the mothers of the uh, the dirt of the disappeared. So the, the this typical stereotypical image of women who who lost uh, uh, someone and 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 they are concerned about those who are dead and and disappeared but they are incapable of witnessing about which happened to themselves so uh, it's for example known that in the truth and reconciliation commission in south africa only 140 women reported uh, on sexual rape whereas it was of course uh, and uh, endemic it was uh, like, like everywhere what what's also your point so i what is uh, very important in this encounter between uh, feminism and, and and transitional justice is that in these these in the setup of the trcs uh, women are taken on board because the the concept of where you can testify about i think a lot of South African uh, feminists have written about it, Tristan and Borer or Shakti Jason among them. Uh, this famous article, I think I even gave it to the students to read, gendered um, war and gendered peace. Huh? That it, it is very much, uh, um, from a male perspective, it's, it's very much defined what counts as being violated. And for that, and that these concepts are taken as uh, starting points of the, the transitional justice debate. So in the setup of where you can testify about, it already becomes very difficult for women to testify um, about sexual abuse because what counts as violence um, is mainly about, yeah, it has a different conceptualization, that's one thing. And what is also an effect of, of war and conflict on the lives of women is, of course, the social economic consequences, which are also not uh, very often or hardly ever taken into account as part of, um, of conflict that uh, yeah, women have no future, so to speak. So the, the, there is very much this, this three um, level approach that if you want to do justice, if you want to set up these uh, uh, transitional justice bodies, you need women in, in the setup of the body. And if you invite women in the setup of the transitional justice framework, you need to gender uh, what, what the problem actually is, where, you're, where, where the conflict is coming from. And then in the end, uh, feminism comes in when you are looking for solutions. So how do you uh, what you were also you know, rightly uh, saying that what kind of future can you imagine if um, your memory about what has happened cannot even be articulated in the present. So yes. that's and that's also very much, I think, why these uh, artistic examples were very uh, beautiful and, and telling because art can do something which yes. uh, which, which which the law, the discourse of law probably cannot. It can sort of show this conspiracy of silence uh, in a way. Um, 
um, this erasure of of um, so your explanation of the women um, feeding into the stereotype of the caretakers, mm -hmm. I think it's very very true. But at the same time, it also shows um, what has been hidden by that that stereotype and how it is impossible to um, yeah to claim what has been done to them, their part in the in the yeah. effort. That's big, yeah. yeah. I, I can only confirm. Thank you, Rosemary. It's it's very it's very true. And I think that one of the things is that um, so the Peruvian Truth Commission was the first who after uh, the, the first Truth Commission to include sexual violence in its actual uh, investigations, in its in its um, um, interviewing uh, and taking statements, testimonies of, of men and women. And uh, uh, the truth commissions after that came afterwards have done that much more. So every time, that's why what I said previously, yeah, that's true. that yeah. this whole expert community is progressing. But, but you, so it's not only perhaps the political context that um, makes all these different um, transitional justice processes so unpredictable, but also the normative and cultural elements within there, particularly in terms of gender. Absolutely. And I think so art is one thing that is really useful because it helps. It gives people a platform, basically, to say things and denounce things that they otherwise might not be able to do. Um, but at, 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 and and if there is no criminal justice or if there's no accountability, let me say that is criminal justice is very specific and very difficult and very tough. And um, but th there is something broader about accountability and about taking responsibility. And if the military doesn't take responsibility or e even the Ministry of Defense, I, if the higher up don't take responsibility and don't recognize that this is what happened and uh, takes responsibility for it, then it's very then it is literally constantly a fight. You no. Know? And women don't have that. They don't have the energy, the resources. There's, there's just no way, you know, that that women in the high Andes um, can fight that fight. It's just there's no space for that. There's no economic resources even. There's no information. There's no access. There's no network. There's nothing. So um, it, it's true that there's all these layers and obstacles to gender justice. But that's why I think it's so important to take the long term view and to see, well, OK, so it's um, 30 years afterwards, but there is now a trial and there is now um, uh, talk about these issues and there is now art and there's now debates about the different harms that have been done, the different gen gender harms. So I think that this long term view is still really useful because without the discussion about those previous harms, about conflict related harms, it just festers and goes on and goes on and goes on. And it just normalizes more and more and more. You know? Violence becomes a normal aspect of, of society and of uh, particularly gender based violence. So in order to break through that, I think that these discussions and art is a very powerful tool, I think, for doing so. Uh, that these discussions and debates are necessary. Thank you. Thank you for giving us some hope within this terrible well, it's, conflict. <laughs> it's important uh, to always yeah, see. Yeah. There is one question from Kath, Catherine. So I would like to give her the floor. Is she still interested? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask about the part, because I'm from South Africa, uh, and I want to ask, who, which artists you focused on? I know that you were writing more about Peru, and I know that the one of the post-apartheid artists was Mary Sabande. Yeah. Um, and then one of the more recent was Setembile um, Cezanne. Yeah. But I wanted to know, um, yeah, if who else contemporary that you engaged with? Because a lot of post-apartheid Art, I think, was obviously not obviously, but uh, very concerned with uh, racial uh, justice. Um, yeah. And now we've had many, many protests uh, and 
recently about gender-based violence. So I wanted to know who you looked at. Um, I immediately, luckily I had the book next to me because I haven't uh, written those particular chapters. Yeah. There is a chapter on, on, um, um, what was it? Oh yeah, there is a a chapter on um, uh, epistemicide in the Cape by Jumba Hutchinson. And Helen Scanlon writes about the student protest from, so similar, so thinking about sort of performance protest as artistic resistance, if you wish, because the student protests in South Africa in 2015 till 18, or still ongoing probably, make that link between historical gender and racial violence as well, no? And you see that in the way that performance is being staged. So that is also an, uh, um, uh, an aspect of, of one of the chapters in, in the book. But I encourage you to, to read those chapters because I can't really speak that much about other people's work. Okay, no, thank you so much. Sorry, I just ran out of uh, access on Google Books, so I will find the book. Um, yeah, thank you. Order it for the library. Uh, may, we might have it, don't we, in the UU library? We run out of Google space, gosh, what are we? <laughs> okay, I think if there is not anyone else, we reach wonderful the one hour and a half of uh, fascinating material and important, import, very important issues and also beautifully articulated how you do gender um, through commemoration and art. It was very interesting to see in which the memory word, the French style has been transformed or translated by you. It's a memory struggle. And now that in the context of Latin America takes a different balance because there is an institutionalization of the memory and the way in which the past has to be uh, commemorated. So I think there are parallel with uh, Peru and Colombia in this, mm -hmm. even though you said the museum was a successful idea, but difficult to get it off the ground. So how memory even is appropriated as a form of violence, eh? it's kind of interesting Instead of working through, it becomes another more tool of appropriation and expropriation, as you said. Uh, it was very beautiful to see the, the this campaign against uh, sterilization. I think there are many parallels also with India and many other countries in the world. And I don't know if you know uh, Julieta Chaparro, who used to be our colleagues and now went to the UK. She's at Cambridge University. Oh who has written a PhD on this. So it was very beautiful to see the way in which uh, activism visualized and mobilized uh, those kind of protests. Uh, and I, I thought that was very impactful and very powerful. So that's beyond the stereotypical role of uh, madres and something, eh? just the, the new generation coming up in those protests. So it was beautifully articulated, yeah, the site of commemoration, cultural intervention, activism and art. I think uh, there are paradigms that could be applied uh, in other contexts, but you also show with much detail and articulation, everything is still specific and historical and grounded. So you need to do like also the fine work uh, in order to put all these threads uh, and analysis together. It has been mesmerizing, we're really wonderful, not only for the doing gender lecture, but also for all the people doing uh, post-colonial studies and transitional justice. I have one more question, I don't know whether we have time for that, because you talk a lot about art and Latin America, and we always have these questions, when is art decolonial, and what can, what can we say that some debates are post-colonial and some of them should be decolonial. I don't know whether you have some concluding thoughts of that, on that as a kind of Latin American specialist. Thank you. So I find the debate about post-colonial, decolonial is very difficult because I don't think that there is one definition of what is what. I mean, I think it's very difficult to do decolonial because these are post-colonial societies, no? And um, uh, that means that, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, Latin America is a settler society just as much as as uh, South Africa or or Australia is. No, and, and you can't you can't think that away. It's there. 
So how do you decolonize that? Well, the only thing is creating more equality. But that's such a huge, th huge theme and it's so broad and there's so much there that I think it's very difficult to pin down what is decolonial and postcolonial. I think personally that um, creating a space where different groups, different histories can come together to actually fight it out and debate it without doing each other harm is a really decolonial feminist <laughs> exercise no and not not everybody will see it like that particularly not if you're part of those no? but if you see a, a more white elite feminist group fighting it out with a more indigenous uh, or rural feminist group and these the, the this is ongoing in peru as i'm sure it is elsewhere or in south africa definitely no but that is part of the decolonization of feminism i guess e even if we can't call it decolonial as something that is but we can call it as a process. So, so I'd like to to stay with that idea of decolonization as a process, and it must be a process and never a thing. And finding alliances. And finding alliances, really important. And process. Thank you so much, uh, Jelke. It has been wonderful. I was so happy to have had you, even though it was online. It's not a question. I wanted to clap. I, yeah, I send you. Some digital memes <laughs> to, of appreciation. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for attending this, for your engagement and question, and for Yelke for having been patient and having shared with us and marvelous work. Thank we you, everyone. Yelke. Thank you for joining, for questions, for engaging. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And of all, a nice evening and probably a wonderful break, uh, unless you still have classes tomorrow which I hope not, <laughs> in case you do. See you in uh, 2022, oh gosh. Bye everyone. Yeah, we will be in touch. We'll be in touch. Bye. Bye.